Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Nina Sanford from UT Southwestern Dallas, Texas. Um, so some folks reach out to me and ask if I might be able to talk about how we manage radiation toxicities in the GI tract. So I thought I'd put together a video on that. Um, obviously, lots we could talk about, um, but hopefully what I uh, will present here is concise, but also has enough detail to be actionable. And of course, I'm always open to any feedback. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to talk about radiation toxicities in the lower GI tract, and four common ones are skin irritation or radiation dermatitis, diarrhea, acute radiation proctitis, and chronic radiation proctitis. So starting with the first, skin irritation, uh, the formal term is radiation dermatitis, colloquially known as a radiation burn. So who is at risk? So one's risk for radiation dermatitis depends on first location of the radiation, really how superficial the target is. So a patient getting treatment for an anal cancer or distal rectal cancer will be at greater risk than if you're getting treatment for a proximal rectal cancer. And then much lower risk would be like an esophagus or pancreas cancer where the target is much deeper inside. Um, the second factor is radiation dose. So using rectal cancer as an example, um, the risk is higher if you're getting higher dose, such as in long course chemo radiation, and then lower if you're getting a lower dose as in short course radiation. Um, sometimes we get asked how you can prevent radiation dermatitis, and unfortunately, there's really no way to prevent it. It's really just an expected sequelae if you are getting high dose radiation to the skin. So how do we manage it? So starting with non-pharmacologic interventions, first I tell patients to not use toilet paper to vigorously wipe, um, but to switch to using wet wipes and particularly alcohol-free ones. Next, um, we'll talk about doing a sits bath. And what is that? It actually took me a while to figure it out that is really just sitting in a bath um, to soak your bottom in warm or lukewarm water for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, some patients put Epsom salt um, in the bath. They can feel, they feel that that can um, help soothe the skin. And then also uh, a peri bottle, which stands for perennial bottle, can also be helpful. Um, that gently sprays water to the affected area, kind of like a portable bidet, a picture shown here. Um, speaking of bidets, you can get a bidet attachment on Amazon or also purchase a donut pillow, as shown here. Um, that really takes the pressure off of the affected area. All right. Um, what about topical treatment? So usually the first thing we go to is Aquaphor. Um, that contains Vaseline plus additional ingredients, mineral oil, lin linolin. And the goal of that is really to lock in moisture. We typically recommend this at the, at the first sign of erythema or itchiness. Next, we'll go to Silvadine Cream. Um, that contains an antibiotic to prevent infection. And typically, um, we have patients start using this at the, at the first sign of desquamation, which is peeling of the skin. Um, remember that, aqua, that uh, Silvadine can sting or feel drying, so sometimes it's helpful to mix with Aquaphor. Um, there are a range of other topicals that patients can use, um, including aloe vera, that can be soothing and less sticky than Aquaphor. Um, there are topical anesthetics like lidocaine or emla cream, um, hydrocortisone or betamethasone or steroids, they can be helpful for itching, and then desitin, which is zinc oxide, some patients also find helpful. Um, things to remember are first not to apply a thick layer on right before radiation, because if there is a thick layer on the skin that can actually alter the dose, so the skin is actually, would actually get a higher radiation dose, which would of course exacerbate the radiation dermatitis. Um, I tell patients to consider putting on maybe at night or before sleeping so they don't have to also worry about it getting on their skin. Um, airing the area out also helps. Um, so toward the second half or at the end of treatment, I tell patients to um, let that air area that is affected um, be exposed to air. That can really help with healing. All right, let's talk about diarrhea. Um, I think we all know what that is. Um, the first thing is to make sure that the patient is hydrating. Um, aim for eight to 12 cups of fluids daily um, and consider IV fluids if they're not able to achieve that. Um, the second thing is to talk about their diet. And we typically recommend a low residue or brat diet with bananas, applesauce, white rice. Um, these foods can bind stool. And when we say low residue, that means that um, more of the nutrients from the food are absorbed and less excreted, irritating the GI tract. 
Typically, um, patients are recommended to avoid spicy and high fiber foods, which can irritate the area. Um, what about supplements? So these are typically fiber supplements. Um, and the goal of the fiber is really to normalize the stool, um, such that it's actually recommended for diarrhea or if they're having constipation. Um, the two most common ones would be citricel and metamucil. Citricel is methylcellulose fiber, metamucil is psyllium fiber. Um, between the two, I typically recommend citricel um, because the metamucil can cause bloating and gas. What about meds? So typically um, when patients are reporting four or more bowel movements a day, that is a trigger to start medications. Um, the first go-to is Imodium, which is an over-the-counter drug. Um, we typically start with two tabs, two milligrams each at the first episode of diarrhea, and then one tab every time thereafter, maximum eight per day. If the patient is having sort of persistent, um, like on schedule diarrhea, um, they can take one or two tabs first thing in the morning to try to prevent that from happening. Um, after Imodium, typically the next drug we go to is Lamotil. That contains diphenoxylate, which is an opioid agonist that decreases the motility of the GI tract. Um, that's a prescription drug, and that is also taken up to four times a day, and one can alternate with Imodium. Um, I put tincture of opium here. I personally have actually not prescribed this, so I can't speak to it with regard to efficacy or um, any side effects, um, but the, the stated dose is 10 to 15 drops every three to four hours, um, typically reserved for really rare um, refractory diarrhea. All right. Let's move on to acute radiation proctitis. And I separate acute versus chronic because really, as you'll see, the pathophysiology, the symptoms, and the management are different. Um, so acute radiation proctitis occurs during and up to three months after. And this is a result of direct mucosal injury. Um, risk factors would be high radiation dose to the anorectal structures. In my experience, that is a bigger predictor than dose to the small bowel. The main symptoms would be diarrhea, pain and cramping that can be worse during or immediately after bowel movements, tenesmus, which I'll talk about more, and then mucosy discharge. For acute radiation proctitis, actually bleeding is quite rare. When does it happen? So again, using rectal cancer as an example, if a patient is getting conventional long course chemo radiation, this typically starts the second half of treatment and can persist for a few weeks after. Whereas for short course radiation, they actually don't start having symptoms until one to two weeks after the radiation is over. So it is important to warn patients that this may happen. All right, so how do we treat this? Um, the first is diarrhea management, as I talked about earlier, but important to make sure the stools don't get too firm because that can really irritate and cause worsening inflammation. Um, the second is to consider topical steroids. As I mentioned, um, this process is really mediated by inflammation, um, local inflammation, so topical steroids can help. Um, one thing we prescribe is proctofoam that contains hydrocortisone plus permoxine, which is an anesthetic, um, a picture shown here. Um, it can be helpful. The main downside is that it is expensive, and then the applicator can be awkward for some patients. Um, an alternative would be anusol HC, which is also hydrocortisone with other additives, zinc oxide and balsam. Um, that's available as an ointment, a cream, or a suppository known as Proctocream. Um, an advantage um, is that it is usually cheaper and covered by insurance. So sometimes what I'll do, if I don't know how much the drug is gonna cost, which unfortunately happens quite a bit, I'll actually prescribe both to patients and tell them, try the Proctofoam if the cost is appropriate, but if it is excessive, just don't pay for that, don't pick that up and use the Proctocream. All right, let's talk about Bentol because um, this drug has really helped many of my patients. So it's, it's an antispasmodic that we use in situations where the patient is reporting tenesmus. So what is tenesmus um, or how to elicit that from a patient? So you should ask patients, how many trips are you taking to the bathroom where you feel like you have to go versus how many are actually productive, meaning how many bowel moves are actually happening? And if that ratio is more than two, then the patient may or probably has tenesmus. Um, remember that the tumor itself can cause tenesmus due to irritation of that rectal wall. Um, so you may want to start this drug really at the beginning of treatment um, before you would expect radiation side effects to start. Um, and the dose is 10 to 20 milligrams four times a day. I have heard that some um, go up to 40 milligrams four times a day. I have not gone that high personally.
but fentanyl can really be helpful. Um, and, and, and sometimes um, patients or um, clinicians may not uh, be aware of this drug. All right, let's talk about pain medication. So I think this is certainly very reasonable in the short term if a patient is having pain. Um, the main risk is constipation. Um, I usually start with either tramadol 50 milligrams, hydrocodone 5, 325, or oxycodone 5 milligrams. Um, I tell patients to take it every four to six hours. And if it's not lasting that long, then you're going to need to up the dose. Um, for patients with persistent pain, um, or also those who don't want to keep taking pain medications or hesitant to take them, um, keep kind of falling behind on their schedule and can't catch up with their pain, a long-acting pain medication can be very helpful, either OxyContin every 12 hours or fentanyl patch, which lasts 72 hours. Um, remember that if the patient is having bleeding from the tumor, then you're going to want to avoid ibuprofen and other NSAIDs. All right, lastly, for acute radiation proctitis, um, oral dexamethasone. This is somewhat controversial, but I think a smallish dose over a finite period, um, like two to four milligrams twice a day, um, can be helpful. It's pretty low risk. Um, some radiation oncologists actually recommend this for most, if not all, patients with, uh, who are receiving short course radiation. Um, I typically don't um, recommend it prophylactically, but it can really be helpful um, in some situations. All right, last, late or chronic radiation proctitis. That happens three months or after, even years after radiation is over. And the pathophys here is really less inflammation, but ischemia. So ischemia to the vessels, ischemia to the mucosa, mucosa causes atrophy and scarring. Um, the main additional symptom here is bleeding, um, less likely, but can be caused particularly by the scarring, would be perforation, stricture, fistula, or obstruction. You want to do an endoscopy to diagnose this. Um, the most commonly seen thing on endoscopy would be telangiectasias, as shown here. Um, but endoscopy is also important to rule out a fistula or cancer recurrence. So how is this managed? So the first thing to know is that this is going to take some trial and error. It's usually never a quick fix. Um, and there are not a lot of randomized data comparing the different strategies. Um, the first thing we go to is usually a carophate or sucrophate enema. Um, that forms essentially a coating over the mucosa that can promote healing and protect, protect the blood vessels from breaking. Um, you can make this using either sucralfate tabs or liquids, a picture shown here. They're making more of a paste here. Um, I usually recommend more of a liquid enema. Um, typically, I recommend that patients use twice a day during bleeding and then daily after. Um, important to note, as I mentioned earlier, that this is not a quick fix. So you know, a patient may need to do this for a month and maybe even up to half a year. Um, you've also probably heard of sucral fate tabs. Typically, we recommend that for radiation injury higher in the GI tract. Okay, the second um, self-administered sort of topical um, treatment here would be mesalazine. 5-ASA, um, that's an anti-inflammatory used in IBD that can be available in a suppository or pill form. Top suppository is one gram nightly for three to six weeks. Oral is one gram three times a day, and picture shown here. All right, what are some endoscopic strategies? Um, and these are typically for bleeding. So the first thing would be formalin installation. So formalin is a sclerosing agent that cauterizes the blood vessels. Um, this is done by colorectal surgery or GI. It is directly instilled to the affected area with a formalin so, uh, gauze pad. Um, the main risk is strictures, and patients often need repeated treatments. Um, the second endoscopic method would be argon plasma coagulation. Um, basically, you're delivering high-frequency energy through argon gas that can, um, that can help with the bleeding, a picture shown here. Um, this is typically done by GI. Um, and again, similar to formalin, um, often you need multiple treatments. There are other endoscopic methods like RFA and cryoablation. We don't use them quite as much here. The last thing I want to talk about is hyperbaric oxygen, or HBO. Um, this is something that I have found can help patients. Um, the, the mechanism here is that by having patients breathe in 100% oxygen, um, that decreases tissue hypoxia. Re remember that, um, that chronic radiation proctitis is really mediated by ischemia. So this uh, directly 
uh, attempts to address that and promotes angiogenesis. Um, the main downside is that these chambers are not widely available, and it's also resource and time intensive that typically you need up to 60 sessions, each about an hour and a half. Um, I included pentoxophylline and short chain fatty acids. Also, should have probably put vitamin E here. I don't have as much experience with them, but I have seen them listed as possible treatments for chronic radiation proctitis. All right. So, final thoughts. Um, so, something I did not talk about is a radiation break. So, this is something to keep in mind. Um, if the patient is having grade three or higher toxicity, we typically break them, usually for about a week. Um, at that point, it usually goes back down to a grade two. Um, the second is the importance of consulting ancillary services, um, typically dietitian and pelvic physical therapy. Um, for the latter, I actually recommend for pretty much all my patients um, receiving radiation for anal cancer. Um, I put a question mark here, role of bacterial decolonization. Um, recently, um, well, the breast cancer one was a couple years ago, but there have been randomized studies showing the benefit of bacterial decolonization for mucositis and head and neck cancer, dermatitis and breast cancer. Um, there's no reason to think that this same um, strategy wouldn't work in GI cancer. I haven't seen the studies, but hopefully more will come down the line. Um, I did not cover all pelvic radiation toxicities here. Um, of course, there are other ones. These are the most common ones. Maybe I will in future videos um, if that is of interest. Um, last, I wanted to thank Chris Anker for help with um, some of the content here. He is really um, a great friend, also a guru in so many things, uh, GI radiation oncology, including symptom, symptom management. So thank you, Chris. All right. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, I think there um, is a lot we can do to improve how we anticipate and uh, manage these radiation toxicities in our patients and hopefully help them um, get through their treatments and feel better. Um, thanks so much.